Um, <clears throat> it's a truism that behind every good editor is a great librarian. I don't think I would be standing here today if not for the wonderful librarian at the Shelter Rock Road Public Library on Long Island who came to my rescue one lonely winter afternoon with a copy of From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basley Frank Wallow. And over the course of the next several years, gently guided me in the direction of the rest of my life as a reader. <clears throat> From there, just a short hop to Nathan Englander's new novel. I vividly recall the wonder I felt reading the manuscript of Nathan's first collection of stories for the relief of unbearable urges for the first time. Exuberant and daring, brimming with wit and implacable sorrow, it introduced a voice that electrified us, and it put him on the literary map in a way that editors and writers mostly dream of. Ten years ago, Nathan won critical praise for his ambitious first novel, The Ministry of Special Cases, and in 2012, his <coughs> celebrated short story collection, What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, won the Frank O'Connor Short Story Award and was a finalist for, for the Pulitzer Prize. I have been waiting for Nathan to write this novel, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, for 20 years. It's the most commanding and the most irresistible work of his career. A spy novel, a thriller, a love story, and a literary tour de force. It is also an intensely personal book for Nathan, a book he was destined one day to write. He lived through the first intifada in Jerusalem. He was young and idealistic, and he placed all his hopes in the peace process, <clears throat> which he watched collapse, and he left Israel heartbroken. It seems to me that this astonishing work has emerged directly out of that heartbreak. What does it mean to be loyal? What does it mean to be a traitor when the ideals you cherish are betrayed by the country you love. I will tell you the plot in brief because I know Nathan won't. <laughs> a secret prisoner has been held in a black site in the Negev desert for a dozen years, suspended with his guard in a state of mutually shattering existential limbo. How does a nice American Jewish boy from the suburbs of Long Island wind up an Israeli spy working for the Mossad and then a traitor to his adopted country? This is the question at the heart of the novel, and the book tracks his extraordinary journey to that cell from Israel and Gaza to Paris, Italy, and America. Nathan has always had a particular genius for balancing hopefulness and despair. This work, like all his work, unfolds in the darkly comic, soul-sickening realm where the two collide, a place of pronounced cosmic absurdity. I cried twice reading it, and I laughed out loud more times than I can count, starting with the young protagonist's brilliant observation that the biggest challenge at a Jewish spy service is training everyone not to look so guilty. <laughs> it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce my dear friend and treasured author, Nathan Engler. breakfast is so important to Knopf that uh, I usually just tell jokes all the time and they made me write down. This is literally, I'm 47, it's like the first time I've ever written remarks down. They're like, because they knew I wouldn't mention my book. I already heard a laugh now, I'm like, more jokes. Uh, anyway, it's so, first, also you come out of hiding with these books, like it's so nice to, it's, it's so nice to see everyone. I have to find big boy pants and a razor. Like literally, I have, like, anyway. I'm just, just look at the next, look up close. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Next, I'm like three years away from that. I'm two, two, two croissants away from a bra. Anyway, uh, oh, I just want to, uh, all my Jordan, but Jordan Rabbit, thank you. Thank you uh, for those uh, uh, extraordinary remarks. Uh, she knows me so well, including knowing that I wouldn't mention the plot, which I don't in my notes. But uh, uh, honestly, like, thank you so, so much. I, I, the editors are smiling today. The amount of like harassment and invasiveness and like, you know, I have 
yeah, in her life, there's no home she has where I won't show up and like kick down the door with questions. She's just been such an extraordinary sport for my whole life, to the point that when I gave my first reading like 200 years ago, 20, uh, 1996, I was flying from New York to move to Jerusalem and did my first reading at KGB, and I was uh, 12 years old and walking up the steps to my first reading, and Jordan was at the top of the stairs. And, uh, and yeah, she's been there ever since. Um, and I come running up every staircase. Uh, and I do want to thank uh, Kanaf, which is uh, with, along with Jordan, but has just had my back for 20 years. So much love and so much support and really dedication. And as a, a thank you to my publisher, uh, this is really a gift. I've written them a book uh, whose whole plot does not consist of a rabbi eating toast. It's really like a breakaway for me. Anyway, uh, but I really want to talk about libraries all morning because uh, you're here. And it's pretty much safe to say anyone uh, who's standing here, editor, writer, is going to face you this morning. If you're up here, you've been saved by books. You know, I really think that's how you become a writer, and like, that's how it happens. Like, if you think you know, books can cure cancer or grow back hair or answer the questions that no one or nothing else can. Like, that's how you end up being a writer. So Jordan already mentioned, you know, our Long Island libraries. But as someone who grew up, you know with so many questions in such a closed world as a you know little religious suffering kid on Long Island now a suffering man but you know it's it's but that's what I was gonna say that's why despots that's why totalitarian regime that's why they go after writers like after books it's a subversive form because I had no answers anywhere and no way to get to anything except through that you know West Hempstead Public Library that's literally how I found my way you know out to, you know, out of one life and into the world that I wanted to be in, you know, so I'm super thankful for that library, and as long as, uh, you know, and, you know, speaking of how life changed, like, you know, I started there watching my name move super slowly across that reading list. You learn a lot of things early. I was so little. I was like, why are you not winning that contest? I'm still the slowest obsessive. I really was like, I'm never going to win this reading contest, but I still read. I love every sentence and never changed, but that name did not move far. Anyway, so uh, no, I would be wearing my ribbon. Someone else has it. One, one of the Hirsch kids. Anyway, they could read so fast. Anyway, but uh, anyway, so that's that. But I also want to say, like, I then ended up being writer guy, and I ended up with a, uh, I just want to tell you this, a otherworldly library store, but I ended up with a Coleman Center Fellowship a million years later and got to basically, honestly, live inside uh, the New York uh, Public Library. Uh, you know, so I'm thankful also to my research uh, librarians and that experience. I mean, I, and that you get unlimited, unfettered access. I mean, I know every hallway, but I would stay there till 10, 11, midnight, alone in the New York Public Library. And when I would think like sort of a crazy Shakespearean character at Rome, the marble hallways, you know, I, I just needed a robe. But literally, I would just be in there alone. And just as a library moments, because you get to uh, do this probably at your libraries, but at the end of the night when it was uh, time to go home, I would sort of just go over to the wall and there'd be these two walls of like a million switches. And for me, and I would just turn off the second floor of the New York Public Library. And to me, that was like just, you know, turning off the heart of the city, like shutting off Lady Liberty, you know, for me. And it was just such a special thing every night. And I'm still sort of mad that I couldn't stand outside and see it. But that was of things that I will never forget. I was like, I'm just going to turn off the New York Public Library and go home. So you have to go out the side at midnight. Anyway, but I'm here today to tell you about my novel, A Dinner at the Center of the Earth. And it's a library from inside the book that I want to talk about. And I really do feel the strange need to keep apologizing for it, because it's so unlike me to have a novel that has a thriller element and an espionage element. But uh, yet, still, at its core, because it's me, there is a meditation on a fictionalized university library, which is really the reason behind writing this book. And back to torturing Jordan and working on it for years, it wasn't until I understood where that book came from you know, and that moment in my own life, like you, I always say everything's fictionalized, everything's fictionalized, you know, it's all made up, you know, whole cloth and all that stuff, but this is, you know, a library from my life that made it into the book, and that's when I knew the book was done, basically. So when I lived in Jerusalem, when things were really at their most violent and scary and hopeless, when things felt too horrible everywhere else in the city, I'd go to the library. I'd take the bus up to the university on Mount Scopus, and I'd head to the fourth floor, which was the English literature floor. And inside that library, there were Jews and Arabs, religious and secular, right wing and left wing, all the factions of all the many fights working quietly together, all of us united in this community of silence focused on our books and ideas and focused on study. So that's the library, too. You know, it's that shared silence 
as you all know. And while the country was in turmoil, and I'm telling you this is Intifada too now, while the, the battles were going on in the occupied territories and violence, in, and there was tons of violence in the streets of Jerusalem, it was silent in those stacks. And I still remember working on a book and looking out the library windows, like just in my head, and just seeing the skinny faces of the Cobra attack helicopters just like rolling by the library coming back you know, from the war. And I couldn't get over all that contrast and all that alternate possibility. And I still can't get over it. How could that one world exist right inside the other? You know, if we could live together in there, why not outside of it? And as that rare bird who still believes in peace and still believes in a two-state solution, it's taken me almost 20 years, as Jordan said, to sit down and write this novel. It took that long to find a way to communicate that crazy contrast. The feeling that a place could hold so many contradictory realities nestled inside. How could I have been living my life in Jerusalem? Like, this is the kind of thing that would obsess me. I'm standing there, and I'm living in Jerusalem, but a Palestinian you know, woman standing next to me is living at that same moment in Al-Quds. Like, it's just, it's, it's not even a spectrum. It's alternate realities. But that's how it is in that city. The things, everything is what it is, and it's exact opposite. And for me, that idea is uh, another core idea behind the novel, just those tiny things in your head, is this Hebrew phrase, hafuch alafuch, which is that everything is the reverse of the reverse. And, you know, and that's how I wanted to build a book. That's the shape of it. So the last time I was in Jerusalem, I was finishing up Israeli book tour, and I was headed to the airport. And on the front page of the Hebrew paper was the story of Prisoner X, a man who was not alive, literally was not alive until he was found dead. An Israeli spy who'd betrayed his adopted country and he'd been disappeared into the system of a top secret detainee who, you know, that, you know, exactly, did not exist until he killed himself. You know, a reverse of a reverse. And I thought about this guy, he was a Jewish boy just like me, like foreign born, enamored with this place. He moved around the world, quite committed. He joined the Mossad and became a spy for Israel. And then at some point, he'd become a traitor spying for his enemies. And in wanting to talk about empathy, to consider the notion of truly understanding the other side, Prisoner X became for me a way to dream up Prisoner Z. Uh, and the idea for the novel was born. I wanted to explore a character nationalistic enough, idealistic enough to spy for his adopted homeland, and who, not because of greed, you know, there's all the spy things we know why people turn greed or blackmail out of like hunger for power or maybe the presidency, but there's all kinds of reasons you know, people spy for foreign nations. But I wanted to look at someone, like what would turn a spy out of understanding? You know, what would make you a traitor out of, like an, out of sympathy, out of understanding that the other side is the same? Like what would it take to make you turn that way on the country you love? So uh, to talk about these circles inside circles again, to return to the tranquility throbbing inside all that tumult, I took my story of Prisoner Z, spying in Paris, and I set that story inside sort of a literary uh, history of Israel's wars from the Kibya massacre soon after the country was founded to the Yom Kippur War in 1973 and on to Israel's modern day's battles. And then I sort of rolled that up and set the whole thing inside a love story, which is what this book is to me. And then I took that love story and sort of stuck it inside a giant allegory about a piece in which I continue to believe. And that's the novel. Anyway, thanks so much for having me. <laughs>